All right, I think we are just about situated here. Um, give me like, we are live. Give me like 30 seconds here and we'll be ready to kick this off. Oh, you would have told me 10 years ago I'd end up t picking up a hobby as a streamer. I would have told you you were crazy. Me too. <laughs> oh, let's see here. Okay. All right. I think we're actually pretty much ready to go here. I think I am set up. Um, probably don't need the screen share here anymore. So we'll just bring us up on screen. Okay. Welcome. Welcome everyone in the YouTube universe. Hello. Today I am joined with uh, YouTuber Speed of Sound of Gravity. Am I getting that right? Uh, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Great. And um, if you'd like, go ahead and take a you know minute or two and kind of introduce yourself, maybe tell people about your YouTube channel. I did post the link to your channel in the description below, but if you have any other introduction or anything you'd like to share, please feel free. Okay. I just got the cat cluttered off the table. <laughs> no problem. I love uh, kitties too. I got two myself. Yeah, I got two of them. Uh, let's see. Anyway, uh, speed of sound is what I go by. I had to add of gravity because... Uh, I had to come up with something to differentiate my YouTube channel a little bit. Uh, what I, do you What do you prefer to be called for the sake of the conversation? Uh, you can call me Mike. You can call me SOS or Speed okay. or whatever you okay. want. Okay, cool. Well, okay, beautiful. Go ahead. The matter name is Mike. Uh, anyway, uh, let's see. So, so um, my motivation to start a channel is to kind of push back against some of the uh, what I see as misinformation about genetics and evolution and biology. Hmm. And uh, other things, and I think uh, philosophy and materialism and all of that are within scope. So I, I kind of want to get, get into a bit of that. Yeah, I agree with you. In fact, I think perhaps, and maybe you'll agree with me on this, that philosophy as a um, discipline is maybe a little underestimated uh, in its facility in the scientific community. What, what do you think about that? Uh, I've been back and forth on that. Uh, I used to, like, uh, for most of my life, I, well, I got into philosophy when I was a teenager, and I think it almost killed me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. I mean, literally almost killed me. And then uh, and then it kind of saved me uh, when I when I crossed over into Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And then uh, all through my life, I would say that anybody who is like uh, somebody would tell me they're majoring in philosophy and I'd say, oh, my God, you are a brave man. <laughs> you are so brave. And then I uh, then I kind of fell out of uh, I, I, I got tired of it. I got tired of listening to it. And, and I've been sort of in and out of that position. But I have studied a lot of neurophilosophy, philosophy of the mind and uh, got into it. And I, you know, I think it's really an important discipline for framing the argument, I guess. I Not sure if we can ever figure anything out. Well, I'm, I'm kind of on the same page. And just so you know, I, I probably, just to give you a little introduction to me so that I can lay a little bit of groundwork, um, you would find me to probably be a little bit, I'm not going to say unique, but unconventional to a typical, you know, theist proponent. Um, okay. Because I have been down the atheist road and the agnostic road from, um, and, and we don't need to get into this, it's not a huge thing, but but I had constructed certain um, beliefs and perspectives during my time as a theist, which had led me to acceptance of certain atheistic arguments. So I've been down that road and I've even, I could even say at a certain point, I have absorbed and accepted a good number of different um, atheist arguments. But since I've come out of them, you know, I've falsified them myself for me. Now, I'm not saying that that's a fundamental methodology for everyone to accept for their method of falsification, but it's just what worked for me. Okay. 
Okay. So, so now, um, uh, can you uh, elaborate for me a little bit on what your belief, kind of your presuppositional set is based around? Is it the idea that there's nothing in reality except the material or can you elaborate for me a little bit on your, your view? Material and materialism are, you know, it's a problematic term. It um, is. And that's and, why and I'm, I, I would like you to clarify, because if we just jump into it, I, I feel I'm a, we're going to be talking over each other. I would say physical. And uh, let's see, how, how would I explain that? Anything that is within the realm of physics or mathematical physics basically would describe all of what I would rely on. And I'm sort of a uh, presuppositional presuppos strict naturalist in that I will interpret everything in a naturalistic way. Okay. And, uh, and, and it's sort of the, it, it is the, uh, I presume strict naturalism. And then I go ahead and try to, uh, number one, find out what does work within that framework. And at any point, uh, decide that I could falsify that framework. Okay. Uh, so that's um, kind of the position I'm coming from. Okay. Um, does your stance of the materialism, your perspective, you said it's kind of presuppositional, which I get. And frankly, truthfully, uh, as human creatures, we all are presuppositional. Right. You know, we, we build, based upon our lives and experiences and interactions, uh, a set of presuppositions that we hold inside us. And we will generally interpret any new information we get through that prism of our presuppositions. And that's just, that's just a natural component of the human condition. That's just how we function in life. So convincing someone of a different argument without addressing the presuppositions is kind of just hot wind. You follow, yeah. follow what I'm saying? So, so if we could, maybe, maybe it could be a little substantive if you could, I, I mean, I don't want to treat you like a Darth Dawkins here. <laughs> no, oh, no. I, 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 I'm assuming you're not as bad as Darth that you have. Oh, no. Substantiation for your presuppositions at all is um, anyone <laughs> not not yet that i've met not yet yeah. that i've met but i'm holding out hope we'll we'll, we'll have to see if, uh, <laughs> if darth spawns a little clone that's going to be worse than him we'll have to oh. uh, only time will tell so but no uh, maybe you could elaborate for me what your i guess presuppositions of your presupposition are or, or your your validation criteria for the presupposition of the materialism view that you hold um if you could unpack any of that or any portion of that for me okay i kind of start with where i'm at right now the fact that i can pick this cup up i have a red cup in front of me and i uh it, it, it's a hello kitty cup and i call it my red qualia kitty cup mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because i use it as an example of perception right. and uh so 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 there is what what i can what i can do in the universe right now i can pick this cup up and i can drink from it i can look at it right. i can project that and then i go back to a, a, the developmental perspective which has become come important to me because i studied neuroscience mm -hmm. and uh, i understand that i remember back and I accept the fact that I was a baby at one point. And uh, I described my first science experiment as poking myself in the eye. Okay. Uh, basically. And okay. from that, so from that, I developed this idea of uh, the R1, R2 world. Okay. And uh, R1 is basically, I can pick this cup up, I sense certain things, things in the universe work, right? Okay. R2 is an extension of that which we would call science where we rationalize and we we basically we try to know more about something you know i can look into the the nature of the clay that went into the making of this cup or whatever so, so that's so all r2 too. is more abstract components of materialism yeah to be more of the reductive uh scientific okay. look at materialism that sort of thing but r1 is kind of what we all rely on and then oh. around that i would put m m1 which i call metaphysical suppositions uh -huh. like i might imagine that i'm a brain in a vat or i might imagine that so I'm, uh, yeah of course yeah. Well, and by the way Whatever. that would be my challenge probably instantaneously at the end of your statement here would be what is your solution to the problem of hard solipsism uh the um the solution to the problem of hard solipsism everything disappears in into that hole so i mean as soon as you start thinking uh solipsism you you've got to somehow things well, that you know i mean you don't know i mean you don't know beyond a 
you know, the ability to know empirically, I guess, per se. And I, I'm approaching this from a little bit of an epistemological nihilist perspective that we can't really necessarily know anything for absolute certainty. Like, you know, I mean, we could be in the matrix and these things like, like your example, your red cup that you're holding up could just be a series of digital codes you know, right. that are being hardwired into your brain to interpret as a red cup. And everything that we're in could be a illusion of what is actually there if you if you see what i'm saying and that's where you know solipsism to me was the answer to the empirical knowledge claim you see like one solves another and then another contradicts the other so yeah. when when a when a christian or a theist or whatever comes forward and says i know god exists the solipsism argument is to diffuse that and say you really can't know anything you know, right. and so, so the best that you can do is to operate on a level of confidence. Now, I can understand your perspective of natural and naturalism and perspective uh, coming from a stance of high confidence. I have the highest confidence possible in believing that I have a red cup in front of me. But right. even then, you're never going to be able to, aside from your own personal sp perspective, you're never going to be able to translate that to another individual with the same level of empiricism. Like, like, I mean, you're talking to me saying you have a red cup. I believe you. I have no reason to not believe you. But I have no empirical method of which to validate that. Correct. See what I'm saying? Yep. And so solipsism in all of the possible worlds, basically, uh, you know, you, you look into many – basically possible worlds or modal logic mm -hmm. uh, end up in the M1 area. And the M1 area, the interesting thing about it is that there's an infinite number of possible worlds. I could imagine I'm a brain in a vat run by a mad scientist. I could imagine right. the mad scientist is a man or a woman. Is a clown made out of candy. <laughs> clown made out of candy. <laughs> so, so anyway, so, so the, the probability of any one of those things being true, unfortunately is one over infinity. Right. So I just, so I so I drag my ass back to uh, uh, R one R two and say this is what I can know, gotcha. and gotcha. and if I and if anything fails the test of R one R two, I'm gonna have to start looking for a good M one right. you know, that fits it. So gotcha. So so the your perspective of reality is, is really along the lines of, and, and I think I'm accurate in saying it's just this is your highest level of confidence for what you perceive like this is what makes sense to you i mean you can't perceive and i'm, and I'm not trying to draw this out to a to a to an awkward conclusion but but I just so so i'm summarizing correctly the idea is that the only confidence you can find enough to have belief in is the material the, yeah. the natural so so anything that kind of extends outside of that is the realm of no confidence in the belief in it is that it's not that you know it doesn't exist you just have very, very low confidence that it does exist. Yeah, and I push back on the idea of absolute certainty or uh in, yeah, I do in, too. I do too. And that's why I'm confident. trying to that's why I'm trying to kind of set the set the, the table here on that. That's all. I also push back against the idea of reality. Uh re reality to me is uh more more utilitarian. Okay. You know, it's a, what can I do in the world? Uh can I pick this cup up? That sort of thing. A reality beyond that saying, you know, there's some ontological deeper form of really real. Uh -huh. You know, you want to capitalize reality and capitalize real and call it really real, uh, I think is kind of where philosophy starts to get off the tracks, runs off the rails. Well, it, it goes, well, it kind of has to deal with unknowns, you know, because now we're starting to contemplate things that we can't possibly empirically verify or validate. Right. You know, so so when we're trying to come to conclusions about anything outside the natural world, I think it's important for us to remember our ability to naturally detect it will be limited because it's not natural. Yeah. So by by nature of it being non-natural means that a empirical type of standard perhaps for it. It yeah. is unrealistic. It, it'd be like asking for a square circle in our three-dimensional reality. See what I'm saying? Yep. And no. ultimately, go ahead. go ahead. Ultimately, scientific physics could end up getting us somewhere out there in a kind of geometry that we would not recognize. 
And I mean, there could be something and, and, uh, no, I agree. I think there is a potentiality of a higher dimensional plane where such a thing could exist. And, you know, you don't have yeah. to stretch your imagination too far to believe that because right. if you try to quantify in your mind a tesseract, which is just a four dimensional shape, we're not talking about something in the, you know, umpteenth dimension. We're just talking about a four dimensional shape, trying to relay that to people as the unfolding box where all the portions of the unfolding are all happening in one space at one time. That's very difficult to correlate to someone and explain without some sort of, you know, kind of in-depth physical representation to show them. Right. You know, and so and, and imagine the same thing for a higher dimensional principle. And so I, I guess here's my struggle. Here's my struggle with the idea of, of materialism or naturalism as a frame of reference for interpretation is that unless it can establish for itself a realistic falsifiability criteria then it's probably not within the realm of rationality. See, because you can say, I won't believe until, I won't believe in the quantum foam until I can empirically see the quantum foam. Well, that's fine. You can set that standard, but that's not necessarily a real realistic standard. You see what I'm saying? Well, that's why uh, basically uh, naive empiric empiricism would uh, kind of fails us. We, we get to get out into R2. And we start looking for uh, like the noumena, you know, what well, what, but what really R1, is out there. Isn't R1 kind of your primary presupposition, just that which you can observe? Yeah, but it's, it's um, I guess it's verified by R2. You go out and you, you know, like, okay. Uh, I have. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm sorry. So, so let me try and clarify this. I, I don't want to yeah. make a mess of it. I'm not trying to make a mess of your argument. I promise. Um, so the R1 is your deduction and the R2 is your induction. So like you, you have the R1, everything in your R1 perspective is functioning, functioning properly. And then you will defer to the R2 to verify it. Am I getting that? kind of correct right and and the r1 are blends into the r2 because okay like i i mean i can see what's around me right now i have this this uh in the moment reality right but i also remember that i got out of bed this morning and i remember that i had this meeting and i remember and i know what people are and i know that you are one mm -hmm. you know so all, all of these things are r they they come from r1 but they blend into r2 because now i'm now I'm reasoning about what you are and what I am, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then the where the loop closes for me is I come around and I look at the trees and I look at the world around me. And then I land somewhere out there in the forest and then I walk back up to myself. I walk up my toes, my ankles, my, my legs, you know, up into my brain. And I realize that I am an organism in huh. the world, mm -hmm. okay? And, uh, and this shades into Buddhism a little bit, but I'm an organism in the world. And then I start to understand myself in terms of being a biological organism. Mm. And then that's what I've got. And that's what I have to deal with. Are, are you still a, a Buddhist? Uh, I believe, yes, I, uh, I am, uh, I would define myself as a, uh, materialist Buddhist. They call me a Buddhist over on rational skepticism. Okay. I have a lot of posts on Rat Skep if you want to find out who I am. Okay. Uh, okay. As speed as speed of sound, uh, they, they they call me a Moodist because the materialists and the atheists don't like spiritual atheists, and right. I am one. Right. And uh, and I'm a Moodist because I realize that I am an organism. I am in the world. I am a part of this world. Uh -huh. And I and I have to and and I'm not just a not just a rational little thought. And I, I mean I can't reason everything away. Like right. for instance, I couldn't reason my alcoholism away. <laughs> you know, I kept coming only, back. You know? If only, yeah. Yeah, I can't reason cancer away. I right. can't reason my age away. That sort of thing. Right. And and this happened to me when I was 15 years old, and I had a uh, a grand mall spiritual experience on uh, Christmas Eve mm -hmm. at about 9:30 p.m. Uh, to one week before my 16th birthday, and this changed my life. Uh, pretty right. seriously and it gave me a new way of looking at reality and looking at my life so well, now can you can you anticipate that maybe i'm sensing a little diametric contradiction here 
Uh, if you are, uh, I don't. Uh, <laughs> well, and I mean, maybe I might miss be mi potentially misunderstanding the your perspective of Buddhism, and maybe you can correct me. Oh, okay, but, sure. I, I believe the idea was that you are a transitional form. You are currently in a transitional form. You are attempting to attain a higher position of personhood, a, mm -hmm. a, a position of, I guess, nirvana, essentially, a, a state of peace and perfect awareness and perspective of the reality in which you exist in. So in every, yeah. which is why to me, I understand, and, and actually this is one of the things about Buddhism I actually think is interesting, if not even admirable, is that there's no strict school of Buddhism. You know, right. you can be a Buddhist and whichever way you find your path to nirvana is the correct way. Right. You know, it's not like it's not like it's set up. Nope. You have to follow this school or this sage, you know, at this time who had it right. And he clearly attained it. No, it's you are on your own personal path to this, you know, higher attaining of existence. But of course, I guess this is where it maybe is falling apart a little bit for me. You do believe in naturalism and i guess i'm looking to where your ultimate um pinnacle state of existence would still fall within the classification of natural i guess okay uh let's see i i guess it falls right back to where i am right now so i am at that pinnacle right uh -huh. now uh-huh uh i call it nirvana or i would call it nirvana okay because i have quit trying to attain okay uh, I started out when I was 15. I had You're that better experience. than the Dalai Lama. You're better than the Dalai Lama who still has the has the he, urge and he, desire for the free of Tibet. And he can't he see just has to that, stop. unfortunately. You know, he has to stop. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I, I mean, I think it's funny. It's one of those funnier contradiction. I'm not trying to pit poke at you or anything, but, you know, the idea is to get rid of all wants all desires, yeah. Yeah. you know, and, and as if they are the enemy of the human condition. And I understand where they're coming from by that, but there are wants and desires that are good, that are positive, that are actually to the benefit of other people. So to, to me, Buddhism in many principles ends up throwing the baby out with the bathwater. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Wants and desires. Uh, I, I have them all of the time. Right. They're, uh, my life is peppered with them. Right. But it getting be. You're human, getting it right? <laughs> right. But if I were to get attached to one and become obsessed with it, you know, like right. I need cheesecake right now, I have to go. Right. I have to go get cheesecake. Uh, but I could also get attached to trying to get rid of that want. That's mm. also an attachment. Mm, so indeed, that's true. Yeah, no, I would so, agree with that. I would agree so with that. When I was 15, I had a three-day experience where, where the world lit up. I mean, it was it was wintertime, you know, December <laughs> in northern Minnesota. And the world was like just bright white to me and, and everything made sense to me and everything was at peace. And then it, and then I tried to hang on to that experience. And then of course it slipped away as soon as I tried to grasp it, like smoke, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. smoky saint. <laughs> I don't know if that's yeah, exactly. And as I tried to grab, and, and then when I did it, okay, it was 1966. Guess what happened in 1966 and seven uh, hippies found LSD. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I had never taken dry. I didn't take uh, LSD until I was 19 years old. Mm -hmm. And then I went ahead and I took LSD and I was like, holy, uh, this is very, <laughs> this is almost like the spiritual experience, but it wasn't quite right. right, right. It wasn't lasting. It wasn't uh, firm. So I went seeking for years. And, and then of course I, uh, well, the whole drug experience melted away into methamphetamine and other bad things. And, and I went way off track. Right. And uh, finally, you know, uh, 13 years ago, I sobered up and I kind of let I had gone through uh, the most horrible cocaine and, and uh, vodka abuse that you can imagine for a human being. Mm -hmm. And I gave up my life entirely. And I I had given it up. Uh, I had decided to end my life. And I, you know, I realized that if I didn't end it, it was going to end anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I sort of gave up and I was laying on my uh, floor. And I remember saying a prayer, and I do pray. And uh, I said this prayer basically after I had uh, tried to uh, 
I don't know how much I should. T- I I guess I tell this in AA meetings. So well, no, it's and, and it's fine. No, I, I I'm I'm all for hearing about. So again, you know, your life experiences are part of the product of your presuppositional tool set. There's nothing wrong with exploring it, please. Right, they're part of what I'm leaving behind, so right. I don't mind talking right. about it. No, them. of course, absolutely. But I had a 20 foot uh, long vacuum cleaner hose for our central vac, and uh, and I was inexplicably naked because I couldn't stand the feel of clothes on my body anymore. I kept ripping them off. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's what happens to you in severe depression when you're ready to kill yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wrapped it. I was trying to carry this hose out to my 82 Ford Thunderbird so that I could stick it in the exhaust and kill myself. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, I would have had to walk up a hill. I would have had to get out the door. And I couldn't get, I, I, I couldn't pick the hose up all at once. So I wrapped it around my body. Right. And, and then I collapsed on the floor uh, on top of a lit cigarette, as it turns out. And uh, and I, I I remember saying this sort of like a Buddhist sort of prayer that I'm done. I quit. I, I give up. This is ridiculous. And then I passed out for 12 hours. I woke up, uh, blood and vomit on the floor, uh, burns on my body and i went into the bathroom we have a full-length mirror and i looked at my body and i had i looked like an alligator <laughs> right <laughs> and i i burst out laughing now it was the funniest I, thing i had ever seen i couldn't even kill myself right I mean, <laughs> was, yeah, and, that's, and, that's that's radical and it was like uh, but it was still i think i i have no law no idea how many hours or days or months it was after that that I walked into an AA meeting where I, uh, and, and I don't even know why I went. I went because my sister threatened to dial 911 and uh, put me in the hospital. And I reasoned if I go to the hospital, I can't do any more cocaine. So I can't go to the hospital. Mm-hmm. So I'll go to, and she told me if I didn't go to an AA meeting, that she would uh, basically put me in the hospital. Mm-hmm. So I went to an AA meeting and I walked in. And as I walked up the steps, uh, I, I sort of executed AA steps one, two, and three. Uh, powerless over alcohol came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity mm-hmm. and made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand them. Mm-hmm. And when I did that, uh, I came out of there and I knew that I would, for some reason, I knew that I would be sober for at least a few days. And I'd never had that, uh, lug- I hadn't had that luxury for seven years. Right. And uh, so, so, so I had a transformative experience, right? And I sort of gave up seeking, and I started doing instead. You know, I started working on my uh, character defects, making amends to people. The whole twelve-step, you know, ritual, which is pretty much Buddhism in a, in a in a nutshell. The twelve steps. Gotcha. So. Now, do you? Uh, I do have another question, but but that will take us off this topic. So I just want to. That's fine. Let's go. Uh, one, one more question to kind of finish on this topic real quick. What do you believe? I mean, I know you could kind of said that you believe that right now is your kind of your pinnacle state of existence because it's all you know right now. But are you looking forward to any type of existence that is non-material? I, or, or are you looking forward to a type of, of existence that will be material for that type of existence? Anything non-material to me or anything beyond this would uh, almost seem like a sin to me. It, it, it would seem sacrilegious. Uh, I uh, Basically, this, I, I, if anything, I want to be more in the moment, more of the time, mm-hmm. but I don't care if I am or I'm not. I'm going to die soon. I'm 69. So you believe when you, when you die, that's it? There's no uh, ascension? Well, I, I don't know about that. You see... I never was. I never. There never really was. I, I, it's fine if you don't. I know there's schools of Buddhism that don't have that. That basically do teach that the the best thing you can hope for is to attain your nirvana here now. And I yeah. know there are some t- schools of thought. I just don't know which one you're part of. That's why I'm asking. Not any part that has anything beyond. Uh, I I view uh, uh, reincarnation basically okay. as uh, breaking the karmic cycle. Oh, like okay. if you, if you, a, a lot of, a lot of us have had the experience of, we, we end up in the same relationship with the same uh, man or woman over and over again. And we keep, you know, we, we keep going through the same problems over and over again. That's oh. called a karmic cycle. And the idea of reincarnation is that uh, karma is, is not, cons- it, it's a, it means habit. 
right. in, in some schools of Buddhism. So you, you are in a habitual cycle in your personality. When you break out of that, you are reincarnated. You're out of your karmic cycle. You break it. Well, uh, was, well but if you can't break your karmic cycle, it, it, like for instance, if you've had a, and this is just from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you've lived a crap life, if you've yeah. been a horrible person, you know, you could either A, be forced to relive a life again to try and get it right, or B, you've already done that too many times and now you have to come back as a cockroach yeah. or, or, you know, or something like that, you know, as if, you know, and, and as I understood it with the idea of reincarnation is you were constantly trying to reach towards whatever the existence is above this life. Because if you do really good at this life, if you break the karmic cycle in this life, you earn the opportunity to ascend to the higher level of, as they say, I'm not, I'm not trying to misquote them here, non-material pure energy consciousness. I call that Hollywood Buddhism. Okay. 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 <laughs> it's no, that's it's sort of a wet. That's why I wanted a, to ask you. That's fine. Yeah, it's a westernized version of Buddhism. Okay. Uh, whereas, you know, I, 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 I'm living my life. One day, I probably won't be conscious anymore, mm -hmm. and everything will just just fall away. Uh -huh. But that will not detract from the fact that I am conscious now. Okay. Uh, the way I put it is um, is. Uh, I, I got to be careful how I word this, but but a That's long time ago, before I was born, when I was still dead, uh -huh. okay, I was not, I, I was in this, uh, basically I wasn't thinking at all. Uh -huh. And then I had this life where I am thinking and I wake up every day. I have these intermittent spots where I sleep, where I, where I no longer am, mm -hmm. but I wake up each day and then I'm going to die. And then forever, you know, I'm going to enter this. I'm going to enter the same spot I was before I was born. But the interesting thing is that I will always have been. Mm -hmm. I will always have been. So I am extremely grateful. I have this gratitude that wells up out of me uh, for the fact that I got to be, that I got to be here now. Okay. That sort of thing. So that's kind of what it's like. Okay. So. No, no, that that's some clarification. Um. So, so now if we could, I, I would like to transition back because uh, I had a question when you were going through your story, which is kind of interesting. And I've read a few things in the past on the use of psychedelics. And, you know, certainly even some institutions and agencies were trying to find out, you know, the specific chemical compounds that might make people a little bit more I don't know, a persuasive or, or a genteel or easy to persuade or talk to or question, you know, because there's been tons and tons of studies on the use of psychedelics and, and their effects. Um, LSD and many other, you know, forms of these psychedelic drugs that tend to give you these kind of hallucinary type of states in a very weird, almost seemingly biological contradiction, they seem to also decrease brain activity so it's where you're having an enlightened experience with tons of stuff going on super vivid crazy insane imagery but your brain activity doesn't increase it actually decreases yeah but, well it it becomes more uh, like in the brain scans they've done it becomes more multiply connected across all modalities in your brain okay and then there, there's another state of your brain like if you're focusing on something like uh there's something called the thalamus uh -huh. which which uh which kind of controls or operates your cortex uh -huh. like if you if you're driving on the street and you see a stop sign what happens first is that you see the sign and put in a whole field of your thalamus lights up okay. and then you see then you see okay it's a road sign and your thalamus tightens up a bit right. and then you see it's a it's red and it tightens up some more and then it's a stop sign and all of a sudden you're hyper focused on this one thing that is kind of what happens uh that is what Buddhists try to unachieve this okay. tight, this tight concentric focus on mm -hmm. things. You try to fuzz out that sort mm -hmm. of thing, and okay. you end up. But anyway, LSD fuzzes you out so that everything is all coming in at once, and you can you can't tell where you end and the world begins. Right. Well. Well. Yeah. And that's. And I'm. I'm not really specifically talking about the sections of the brain that are deactivated for rational thought, but just and to me, just the overall decrease in brain function itself it, it's its level of activity like when you're 
when you're having an LSD experience, you're expecting that the same stimulation is going on in your brain as if you were experiencing it in the real world. Because to you, it's real. When you're sitting there having a trip on acid or LSD, what you're experiencing is vivid and real, even though it's not to the rest of reality. But it's hard to draw a correlation to your brain being the one manufacturing all of this imagery, all of this, you know, different stuff just by the lack of activity in the brain. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, it's... I'm not sure. I, I don't think this lack of activity is quite as extensive as you think it is. It, it okay. tends, the the scans. Well, the things had, that would normally interpret and fire for the interpretation right. of things are not typically doing that during these trips. Right. Like, like what would norm? What you would you be using in your brain to interpret your reality? Those those aren't firing either consistently or correctly, or even not at all. Right, exactly. And what's happening is your sensory input is 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 alive from from every direction, and and it comes in, and then you can take those things and you can create entirely. It, it, you've seen the movie Walt Disney's Fantasia. Oh yeah, of course, yeah. You can, you can create Fantasia in your mind while you're listening to music, but mm -hmm. then you can fuzz back on. And you can start to. Uh, I, I think on LSD when you take LSD, what you mm -hmm. perceive is a more accurate version of your reality as an organism in the world okay. than you get when you're uh, when you're not taking LSD. When you're thinking, and and the part of the the activity that quits is these tight focus loops and these rhythms that run across your brain that you know we we use to navigate the world you let go of that and you sort of fuzz out when you have a spiritual experience you are doing the same thing you start letting go of that tight rational focus mm -hmm. and you give yourself over to this uh uh you know we'll call it god for lack of a better word you, uh -huh. you give yourself to the world something higher something higher. beyond higher us in yeah. essence yeah. Um, so is it, does it mean anything to you of any level of importance? The, the, some of the data that's come out about people's near death experiences now, and I'm not talking about the ones where, Oh, I went to heaven and I saw Jesus, you know, yeah. I don't care about those. You know, those are, those are wholly irrelevant to me. I'm talking about the ones where people died on the operating table or, or had a, had or basically went into a coma and were able to perceive the goings on actions of other people in different rooms, even reading other people's charts, knowing when certain people died, all these other types of things that happen in those particular contexts. Does that give you any type of evidence or even nuance to the illusion that there could be a consciousness in us that is not strictly material? I've not found any of those things uh, to have been verified. And I don't believe they oh. happen. I believe they're. I believe oh. they're manufactured after. But the near death experience is uh, very much like uh, a spiritual experience, and I, and I don't doubt that that as you give up your life and your brain starts to shut down, that you have an amazingly good time at some point. You know, as soon as the pain in your body stops. Okay. Uh, so, but I have not. Uh, I am very skeptical that any of those things have ever been verified. I won't take. I won't take anecdotes. You know, if if, if there was something that could be uh, verified over and over again, then I would start to change my worldview, I'm sure. But I have not seen anything like that. I've um, listened to people. I, I've had I've had similar weird experiences myself. And what I have found is that I tend to doctor everything that has happened to me in the past. Okay. And I doctor it basically over and over again until the memory becomes something that I'm pretty sure did mm. not happen. Now, I'm one to believe that there is no such thing as evidence that is immune to skepticism. Could you could you agree to me there? That, that ultimately, no matter what we could even possibly empirically produce in our three-dimensional reality, someone would still have an ability, if not even possibly a desire, to be skeptical of that thing. Is that, right. Is that, I mean, and we have flat earthers. I don't think we need to look much further than that, right? Nope. <laughs> so we know we know that even even despite what would be a um, insurmountable, incredible amount of evidence to the contrary, the flat earthers still cling to what they they cling to. You know, so we know in our reality, just as a nature of the human condition, you know, we can 
basically convince ourselves out of anything or convince ourselves that anything doesn't exist. Now, I pulled up on the screen, and I'm not sure if you can see it, but this this is an article. I did find it very interesting. I don't think we need to go into all of it the whole way, but this is just one of dozens um, online that is specifically regarding the science of near-death experiences. Now, and again, you remen- remember what I said, how I said I don't care about the people talking about how they went and saw Jesus or saw God or saw heaven or met the angels. I don't care about any of that. And and I find that many times, personally, being a theist, being a Bible-believing Christian, is I, I find that many of those times that people aren't using discernment, it's just a cash grab or or an attempt for attention. So I'm ve- I personally am skeptical about near-death experience claims. I am. And I feel that if I'm not being at least skeptical about them, then I'm being disingenuous, if not potentially irrational. However, it, it is also irrational for me to ignore the scientific documentation and verification of the near-death experiences, which where, like I said, if someone is comatose and passed out and being operated on, and then they die, and they're I don't know, quote unquote, consciousness elevates above them, goes into the next room, reads the chart of the patient, goes back to their body, wakes up and tells the doctor what the patient's chart in the next room says. That's that's something that naturalism and materialism will never be able to give an explanation for. So to bring to your explanation since there is no r1 or r2 to refer to on this perhaps we need to refer to the m1 could you agree if you could verify that yeah okay yeah. well let me i i, I, I do mean me if a it favor. happened to do me. me i'll tell you what do me a favor because i, I don't want to spend the whole show on this i just right. wanted to mention it um because i i think we do have some more productive conversations to get to but maybe we can have another conversation in the future uh pull up a couple of these articles and there's done t- just dozens of them of these type of verifications of these types of near-death i mean we're not talking about an isolated anecdotal incident here we're talking about hundreds. In fact, um, do you know who Gary Habernas is? Does that name ring a bell to you? I believe so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, his big thing is the whole resurrection of Christ thing. You know, that's usually his main focus. But he co-authored a book with, I think his name is George Moore. If or His last name is Moore, I'm pretty certain. M-O-O-R-E. And that book was basically just going through only the scientifically validated claims of near-death experiences and the stories of the doctors that were convinced of them. And yeah. that, I forget the name of the book, but it's out there. But maybe maybe we can plan another conversation sometime in the future where we could kind of talk mainly about this, the idea of the non material consciousness if it exists but i just wanted to share this with you maybe you could type that in and even this article which actually comes up on the first page it's one of the first articles it's from the atlantic and it says the science of near-death experiences empirically investigating brushes with the afterlife so and i i I saw 91 million dollars makes me right at the beginning of that article it mentions 91 million dollars that oh yeah Immediately makes me skeptical. Oh, no. Well, well, the, the reason it's mentioning that, the reason yeah. it's mentioning that is because there's people who tell that story. Again, the story I don't care about, right. that they went to heaven and met God. And that's yeah. what people want to read about. And by, see, here's the thing. If you die and you had an out-of-body experience and you watch someone down the hallway in the same hospital die, and then you wake up and say that person at the end of the hallway died. Right. That's not going to make its way into some best-selling book. People don't care about that. They want to hear about the story of how you went up to heaven and hang out with the angels and met Jesus and had tea with Shakespeare. You right. know, they don't they don't care about so so I can understand in fact, sir, truthfully, I'm a little empathetic to the fact that maybe a lot of naturalist, materialist, atheists don't go seeking this information, let alone know that it would naturally pop up in front of them. Because again, the only ones you guys would hear about are the same ones that I don't care about. I right. went to heaven and I met Jesus. I don't care. 
I care about the ones that actually have some semblance of scientific or logical verification. That's what I'm interested. In. So maybe, maybe for our next talk, uh, do a little look into that because I would like to hear your perspective, truthfully, and not just from your materialistic, but your Buddhist materialistic perspective. So we can, we can put that for our next conversation. I'll just share that here. But anyway, let's move on because I know that one of the things you had said. Um, is that you had a couple questions about what had happened with, I, I don't, John Maddox might actually even be here in chat. I don't know if he's inside chat. John, oh. if you're here, let me know if you're inside chat. But you had said you had posed a couple questions or me and John had said a couple things and you kind of wanted to pick our, or my brain about about a couple of those things or something. Yeah, the one different. thing that, uh, when I had the d debate with John, he wanted uh -huh. to, he wanted to lead me down what I consider a pathway in philosophy that's not productive okay. by ask, asking me if logic was material or not. Okay. And, and I, I insist that logic is entirely physical and material. And okay. I don't, uh, and I don't. <laughs> because that's part of your spectrum of the R2, correct? Well, it's a little more than that. It's, it, it's, it, it's a category error to be like saying, is, is this peanut butter? This peanut butter is a Republican. Uh, <laughs> Okay. All right. So asking the question immediately leads us down a path that ends up in a circular argument where you keep going around and around in circles with the, the materialist versus the idealist. And I would not do that. Well, he I was, could see your point. And I, and I, I kind of took him off. I kind of took him off his heels. Uh, he didn't know where to go with me because I wouldn't follow his. So you weren't, you weren't for actually, you weren't really actually holding a hard stance that the abstracts are material you were just kind of going down that road well actually i actually i am uh the the uh, like oh, well, well no please go ahead i mean unpack that a little for me because okay. I, I, I'd, I'd love to hear it so if you're talking about abstract things like our like our uh, mathematics or proofs of uh, formulas or numbers or logic you know the fact that you know there's and or or whatever you are you are necessarily talking about something that is in a subjective bubble which is how we communicate with each other but there's no onto ontological basis to that subjective bubble unless you pop out into the world and try to figure out where those ideas came from like how did i decide what the number two meant well i had two oranges or two blocks when i was a child or whatever and and you have three things these things exist in the world logic is the same way i know that my car cannot be at walmart and in my garage at the same time and and so all of this stuff falls out of the material world it falls out of physicality so i will insist that logic yes is a physical thing you know, so it's, it's basically how this universe works. So, so I, I guess, so I'm trying to help me. I, I, I'm going to try to go slow here because I don't want to, I don't want to misquote you. I don't want to misunderstand this and try to argue something you're not arguing. Okay. So um, just bear with me here a little bit. So when we say there's two oranges, we're, we're simply engaging in a um, axiom basically we're we're basically just applying a abstract descriptor the abstract descriptor itself would never exist if we weren't here to create it right. but the nature of fact the objective fact that there are indeed two oranges would not change whether there was any observer to that fact correct could, could we agree with that so yes. so really when we're talking about the rules of logic and I, I think this is where maybe the conversation gets a little convoluted sometime when we're talking about the rules of logic we're probably not actually talking about the rules of logic we're talking about the rules that lay underneath the rules of logic and the rules of logic are just the axioms that we've constructed to define them do you follow yep so so i, I guess in that sense what I could see from your point is that our axioms, our abstract axioms, our descriptors, these are these are material to us. If we weren't here, if we were not here in a material state, these things, these axioms, these descriptors would not exist. Is that kind of what you're saying? They, yeah, they wouldn't exist. Yeah, of course, we wouldn't be here to talk about them. Right. Right, exactly. But the rules behind those axioms, 
those would still exist whether we're here to observe them or not correct because it's, because it's a fact about the physical universe right yes, exactly now the interesting thing about that is you and, and i tried to do a few short videos on my channel about this under the label of reduction uh -huh. and i want to i want see and because what i think we're tracking down to and i don't mean to cut you off i'm sorry but but what i'm trying to track down to is this you said something really interesting earlier, which I'm hoping that we're going to kind of get to and unpack, which is that the R1 and the R2 overlap. They 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 are kind of in flux and also reliant on each other. So that's where I'm kind of hoping to to drag us to. Yeah, one grades into the other. Right, basically. right, right, right. So, yep. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Please okay. go on. So R2, uh, reductive science, you know, when somebody says life is just chemical molecules or or uh, we we uh, life on Earth began just because of random chance or crazy things like that. That's okay. reductive materialism, and this okay. reductive materialism, or what they call naive materialism, is basically we are human beings. We have we have learned to do this concepting in our minds all of our lives. We've learned how to create concepts like like the number two or two oranges or whatever. Okay. There and 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 we tend to live in that world of rationality uh -huh. and and when we feel real sick and depressed and upset and anxious it's because we are tightly bound in that reasoning part of our mind and if we let go uh of these you know reductive ideas i i mean there are two oranges out there but why are there two oranges i mean why in the hell would we say there are two oranges it's mm -hmm. because there are two things in the world they have this overlapping similarity that we can we can find a sameness to them, right? Mm -hmm. That really exists in the physical universe. The physical universe is this complex, and and my God is complexity. Basically, I have to tell you that. Okay, I, no, the, oh, I appreciate that. That that. I mean, I mean, it's it's fractals and it's complexity and it's things blooming out of themselves. Okay. it's life creating itself. Okay. Because that was the only thing it could do, <laughs> you know that sort of thing. Well, so, it could have not. I mean, it could have not created. Oh so. yeah, I mean, it could it could have not. Uh, you know, and I and, mean, and, and, in all in all likelihood, if we're dealing with probabilities, it shouldn't have. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah. I and mean, you, if we're really I'm, talking about sheer probability, you and I wouldn't have YouTube channels if it didn't. So. Uh, amen. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the, but but I mean, there's this. Uh, there's so much more to the universe that uh that we miss by reducing it to scientific principles even though now what i do is like i study things like plants and molecular biology and i go on i look at my oak tree and i don't just see an oak tree now i can use my spongebob imagination and i can come back and say oh my god there's all these fluids circulating up through the roots and going to the chloroplast and the uh you know right. and it, it, i mean i can see the biology happening so I use my imagination to enhance my perception of reality. And, and that's what you do when you have a really good acid trip. Mm. You, you, you get that Disney animation going with Pink mm. Floyd in the background. Right. We, we used to listen to Pink Floyd a lot. <laughs> and, <laughs> and basically you get, uh, you get this whole thing happening where you are interacting with the universe in an imaginative way. Right. And and to me that is beautiful and and right. that is uh, I, I I mean it's you get tired if you do it too much you know and at some point you have to just relax and have yourself a sandwich, uh, <laughs> take a nap, but uh, but I mean it's it's, it's just a wonderful way to live and so you use R two use it so it isn't all bad this reduction you can learn things and it can open up uh, the universe to you in an imaginative way so you can mm -hmm. blend it back into R one is what I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. So, oh, I get it. So, um, what is your stance then? Because I don't want to assume. Um, I, I mean, you're you're clearly not really atheistic, you know, in a, in, a, in any type of strict sense whatsoever. You know, I call myself like, a hard atheist. Well, uh, you, you know, but but you're also kind of you you deal with a lot of abstracts. Oh yeah. Like like you're very comfortable in the realm of abstract that you that i can understand you're trying to justify on a physical realm and that's fine i don't know if i quite see the connect on some of your beliefs versus your your epistemology i guess is i, I maybe i see a couple ultimate disconnects there but let me ask um you 
you kind of you now you say you're a hard atheist. Yep. Now I now I take a hard atheist as saying you know God doesn't exist, or at least you're very very confident he doesn't exist. What I'm really confident of is that there are no disembodied minds that exist outside of a physical world. That okay. Beautiful. physicality yeah that that's what okay. i'm confident of and because okay. of that i can't believe in a god beautiful um but. so walk me to that what is your belief that the consciousness requires materialism okay uh be, before we get into that i want to say that sure. you know no, when, go ahead. when i come up with all these abstracts and i live in this abstract world and i and in my imagination and all of that i'm sure that god and the universe are laughing at me <laughs> And so you know what I've said the same thing about many Christians, so we're on the same page there. Okay. Anyway, so so embodied mind is a uh, it's an approach to consciousness that kind of popped up uh, probably around uh, 1995 96 with uh, Evan Evan Thompson and uh, Francisco Varela who okay. passed away unfortunately. Uh, Varela was a Buddhism Buddhist. Uh, Thompson says he never will be, but he kind of sounded like it. And they came out in Mark Johnson and uh, 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 Merlo Ponte, the philosopher, uh, Lakoff. I mean, it was it was it was just a whole group of people that came up this idea that uh -huh. mind is embodied, and that when you think, which like when you think words, they've been able to detect that your mouth is actually the muscles are actually moving. <laughs> right. The somatic part of your brain is involved. And they've been able to explain this with neuroscience so that when you so that we learn how to think by moving around in the world right and if you don't have the world to interact with there is no thinking so you come up with this idea that the mind is not well, but in that, the brain. I'm sorry, and i don't mean to interrupt but let me Go just ahead. let me just uh add in my addition to that anecdote that you're painting there yeah. is there there is a presupposition of if a mind exists then it must be material and and it, it, that's fine to go that way, but we are talking about an immaterial mind, so we can't assume the manifestation or existence of an immaterial mind to be the same structure or the same comparison as a material mind. Do you see what I'm saying? Because we're dealing with two different types of things. One is material, one is non-material, so we can't assume the same analogous principles to a non-material mind as we could a material mind. Do you follow? Yep. Are you familiar with eliminativism? I don't know if I've heard that term before. Okay, it's basically on that. The, uh, the group of people. Uh, uh, oh God, who are they? Why do I forget their names? Uh, the uh, the Churchlands, Patricia and Paul Churchland, and Daniel Dennett, and they eliminated. <laughs> they basically eliminated consciousness from our consideration and right. called it a misnomer. And right. I'm, a, I'm I'm sort of almost in that camp. But I brought it back, uh, basically. But anyway, as I went through this embodied embodied mind, I extended it to something I call in worlded mind, where I realized that it isn't just my body that's involved here. It's it's the world around me. So the way I envision my mind and myself when I walk through the world, if I'm standing in front of you and we're having a conversation, or even right now we're having a conversation, you are part of my mind our minds are blended together in, in, in a bizarre way. And my mind consists of this microphone in front of me. It's a, it's a blue Yeti, which uh, inexplicably is painted red. And, uh, you know, my 55 inch monitors, this is my world, the 50 feet around me. And it is my mind. This is what I am. Mm -hmm. So as I came back and I went through this journey of uh, embodied mind and in world of mind, I got rid of this abstract idea of mind. Okay. And, and 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 I no longer believe in it, and that's why I really irritate idealists and people like uh, John Maddox and uh, some others. Because, well, you don't irritate uh, me, I, but but I mean, I'm very hard to irritate because, again, you know, I have these perspectives of people are just basing their perspectives and beliefs based upon levels of confidence, and we simply need to explore those. So I don't really have any emotional stake in any of this. Um, you, you know, I mean, I have I have come to my conclusions through a whole series of presuppositions, arguments, deductions, inductions. And I mean, it would take a lot of effort for someone to topple all of those, you know, because they are in some ways self-reliant on each other. So when someone challenges me on one topic, there's usually a residual that needs to be addressed, you know, or a support structure for it. So one thing I want to pitch, and just so you kind of understand my take on it, uh, on my perspective of the idea of an immaterial mind, 
um, is that the idea of an immaterial mind is any mind, any mind that would be outside of what we recognize as material. Right. So we have this physical three dimensional construct that we've, you know, associated as that which is real. We don't know anything outside of that or what that thing would or could be constructed out of. We simply know it's not this. It's not hmm. whatever it is, is not what we experience. It's something else in order by nature of its existence of what it must be in order to manifest this or to have this as the lower frame of reference for it. It cannot be co composed of that thing. It must be something else. So yeah, and I've completely dispensed with that. Okay. And and I've, I, 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 I've, I've eliminated that from my thinking entirely, and I've come back around to a naive form of realism. And it's, it's, okay. it's, it's interesting, but, but it was a, a sort of uh, well. Let me let, let me just finish away. the anecdote. Let me just finish the anecdote, and then could, could, could I interject something here? Sure. No, go ahead. My friend, immutable destiny is in the. Uh, yeah. No, I see him here. Yeah, he is here. Yes. I, I just wanted to tell you, he's a uh, good friend of mine. And, oh, beautiful. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, he said hi, and he's here, and he it looks like he would also like to do a chat at some point. So we right. would do that. Um, immutable destiny. I did put my email in the chat, so you can go ahead and shoot me a message, and we will get something set up um okay uh we're anyway we're... yeah uh no i'm sorry I, I lost my train of thought there um apologies <laughs> that, uh, was, yeah, my that was my trick that was me. my plot you got me i i gotta <laughs> give you credit well played sir uh no the um the principle that that i that i think i'm trying to understand is the idea that even from your perspective where there's nothing but you said naive materialism is that what you called it yeah i sort of kind of came, came back to okay. the point where so I you believe. kind of circled back around from that argument back to the naive uh, materialism i don't i don't need to really unpack that too much but i guess what i would say is i'd like to at some point oh um, that's fine no yeah. and and we can a little bit more in fact even if you want to respond you can feel free to respond to what i'm about to say um, but whatever would be beyond this physical material world could still fall within the classification of materialism for that thing, because its point of reference is the materialism that is it. And whatever it constructs is the materialism, materialism for the point of reference of whatever is inside that thing. So the perspective is dependent on how you interpret it. We being inside this three-dimensional reality of naive materialism, as you say, have no method to interpret reality other than our subjective placement in it. So right. whatever would be up there could have an entirely different definition of what is quote unquote real. And we are just part of that reality, one small sliver in the pie of all that actually is materialism. You follow I me? Just, I just wrote down sliver before you said it. <laughs> Beautiful. So it's a perspective. I, I call it perspectival. Okay. And 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 I try to visualize it as uh, let's say if you're in a room, you're in a room that's filled with these hanging prisms everywhere, and there's light coming in from the room somewhere. And no matter where you stand, you get an entirely different vision of these prisms and of this light. And basically, we are in this one sliver, this one perspectival point with reality. And it doesn't make it doesn't make it any less true that we only have a sliver. Okay. No. Well. Well. No. It doesn't make it any less true to us. Yeah. You know that, but but that again is well, irrelevant. To anybody. Well, but but that is well not necessarily. That 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 just depends upon your presupposition. If your presupposition is to not accept any evidence other than naturalistic, then yeah, absolutely, and all your perspectives are going to be valid. But they're only going to be valid for you. If you have someone else with a different presuppositional set, even an agnostic presuppositional set, where there could be be something else out there as opposed to a, to a hard atheist perspective, then you would look at evidence of things like quantum foam, near-death experiences, even, even that horrible argument that the atheist tried to make on TED Talks when he was saying there must be multiple universes because stars on the outer edge of the galaxy are accelerating faster than the ones closer to the inside. 
which is just insane on so many levels, but I don't want to unpack that. But, but you see, like there is this desperation to grab at the idea that there is something else out there. So, I mean, and it's oh, yeah. fine for you to take your perspective the way you are, but you're going to have to complete that circle for the rest of us or else we can't join the train. You know what I'm saying? Well, when I, when I hear you talk about the rest of the rest of them who, who don't uh, accept this naturalistic world, I want to save them. <laughs> well, save them by by doing what? I mean, bring them to what? Bring them back to their back to their selves, you know, to what they are, to their own to their own perspectival slice. And uh, well, most people are horrible. Them. Most people are horrible. Most most people are genuinely awful, evil, maniacal, destructive, self serving, egotistical sacks of crap. Unless they have an ideological principle to grasp onto that keeps their their know. activities in check. I'm not finding it that dark. Uh, most people that I meet. I know. No atheist does. <laughs> I'm aware of that. Yeah. I, I, I just find a lot of, uh, a lot of good people out there. I just, you know, and there are, there are if some there people were, that are. If there were a lot of good people out there, sir, honestly, 90% of the world population wouldn't be in object poverty. I find that uh, the, uh, the people that. If there were a lot of good people out there, we wouldn't have di dictatorships. We I find that ev evil goes with idealism or with ideals, and and so I'm kind of the opposite of that. And it's it's like clinging to an ideal allows you to do evil. Like uh, I don't think you can ever detach a human from their ideals. I've gotten uh, into I've... arguments with uh, vegans over eating meat because I'm a I'm a uh, I'm I'm a meat eater a consumer, and I grew up in a butcher shop on a farm, you know, and, and basically I do it as, as a, I do it as an organism. I eat as an organism. And when I eat, I smell the blood and I can see the cow die. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it, it, the, the whole thing weaves together for me. But then when I look at people that, you know, bring it out and try to idealize cows and idealize all of this, right. I, I believe that is evil. I call idealism evil. Well, but it's but you can also represent that maybe maybe rushing to call it evil might be a little too quick. It might be evil out of ignorance. You know, keep in mind. It, let, let's let's reframe it a little bit. If our if our culture hadn't gone the direction it did to the urban the urban jungle, if people were still predominantly reliant upon local sources of fresh right. food as opposed to commercial and industrial manufacturing and food processing. We would have a completely different relationship and perspective with animals altogether. Oh, okay? yes. You know, so what we've done, what we've done is evil because we've, we've changed the perspective of the relationship to make it evil. It doesn't yeah, have to be. It doesn't have to be. It could be beautiful. It could be wonderful. It could be what it used to be in the 1800s. Yeah. But but it but it's not, and it's not going to because convenience and economy and price are more important than animal ethics, unfortunately. And that's just the way the culture has gone. Yeah, and it's, okay. it's uh, we we've gotten like uh, my sons were raised in uh, down on the Twin Cities here in Minnesota, and I was raised in northern Minnesota on a farm, uh -huh. and they don't know that feeling when you eat a piece of uh, when you eat a steak. They don't know. Yeah. The they don't know the feeling of bottle feeding that animal. No. Uh, calling it bossy, slap, you know, yep. hugging it, petting it, yep. brushing it, yep. feeding it, and then killing it. And then cutting it up and eating it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's a whole experience. When you do that, there there is a tragedy that you feel in your soul. Agreed. Uh, a piece of you is uh, the cow bites a piece of you when you bite the cow. Absolutely. And yeah. if I may, and it just it may or may not interest you, but primarily also for the audience, th there is a biblical component in this as well, which actually has to do with, with the Passover lamb. If you look at the history of what was to be done with that as the Jews remembrance of their liberation from Egypt is that they had to raise that lamb. They had to find a lamb that was spotless and pure and, you know, innocent and all these things. And they had to raise it and take care of it and nurture it. And then on the Passover day, this, this member of the family, this pet had to be killed and slain and 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 it's blood put on the doorpost and this this brought a relationship a perspective in the culture of just a genuine appreciation for life yeah 
You know, I mean, the idea that you would uh, associate what you exist in, this realm, this reality, all that you interact with should have emotional weight. And you know what? We've lost so much of that through yeah. our commercialization and industrialization that we have, in my opinion, become relatively unethical in our methodologies and our treatment. I mean, look at it this way. At this point, I mean, you, you answer me this question. Maybe you have a better answer for this than I do. At this point, let's say we just all decided as a culture altogether, let's get rid of uh, commercial meatpacking. Let's just outlaw it. Let's ban it. Let's get rid of it and, and, and just be done with it and all this nonsense. Would we not have to exterminate all those animals? And then God know. knows how That's many... How uh, and God and just let me finish. And God knows how many animals after that would, who who have evolved along with these domesticated animals would also die out. Do you follow me there? Exactly. That's my point. I I would mourn the three billion or or twenty billion cows alive because I love cows. Right. And do you think do you <laughs> like think them. chickens do you think chickens can live in the wild? No. Well, they do in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know there's an island in Hawaii, the furthest most island, where the, they brought chickens and they got loose, and the chickens are everywhere. I had no clue. Oh, I know there's everywhere. a. I they, know there's an island in Japan with a lot of kitties. That I, I tune oh, really? about everyone. Oh yeah, no, it's an island populated by cats. It's outstanding. Yeah. Uh, I think they got another one. They got another one full of rabbits too. I don't know. I guess they just got an island for different animals over there. I don't know what, <laughs> yeah. what the deal is. And they don't have any snakes, I hear. Which is yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that, which is yeah. pretty crazy. Yeah, that's radical. So that's radical. Yeah, but the law that would be the reality of it. I mean, the reality of you know going to a completely vegan society is really right. a difficult one. Oh, I think we can we can transition to it, but I would mourn the loss of all those cows. Well. But then I imagine cows out in the field enjoying themselves munching grass, not right. sitting in a goddamn factory farm. Right. You know? Well, and I don't want to make this a veganism thing. And I, I am right. a little bit because I have a debate with the vegans coming up on Monday on modern day debate. Um, oh, are you uh, yeah. are, are you on the meat side of the Oh game? yes, of course I am. Of okay. course I am. Come on. Of course, who doesn't uh, love a quarter <laughs> of <laughs> Yeah, no. So but but you know, I, I mean and and I know who it is and I've watched a little bit of this. Oh, stuff. which one is it? Is it ask um, yourself? Uh, you know, I don't know if I'm allowed to say the name yet because I don't know if it's been announced yet. So I'm not okay. going to say it. But they are a they are a couple. They are a YouTube vegan couple okay. that that I am debating along with. Um, I believe it's going to be Godless Girl. Well, God um, help and, you. You, you know, I, I just I, I have so you know one thing I want to present as an idea because this is something we should all think about truthfully um, is what happens when we abolish certain things is generally inevitably we create what's called an economic vacuum yep which is basically a place where now any type of business dealings in this realm in this circle of of industry have now been completely outlawed okay well the problem is it never ever ever stays a vacuum okay and what fills the vacuum are black market industries yeah, that's what happened now, with, the drug, drug, with drugs. Drug right, abuse. exactly. So so if you want to have a clear picture of, of whether or not you think the treatment of animals would improve by outlawing it, you aren't paying attention. No. You will open up a black market economic vacuum and the animal treatment will go down not up because it will now no longer be regulated by any semblance of law. This is why this is why we have countries in this world today that still practice slavery that none of us are in a rush to abolish because while it's legal, it's regulated and it's, and it's, and it's modernized. It, it's not allowed to go too far off the left end or, it, and it's not supposed to get engaged in sex trafficking. That's the idea by regulating it. We keep it from turning into something really, really worse. Right. So, so it's the same idea over there. Otherwise the UN would tell its member nations that are still engaging in slavery, stop it, or we're not going to give you any more aid. They can't do that. It would it, it would destroy the country and cause more pain and death than it would help. Okay. Yeah. So we should keep the same mind with these insane ideas to manifest that exact economic vacuum upon animals. If you think you will be helping them, you are insane. Yeah. Yeah, if, uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't mean to do something we're going to agree with. 
I used to be a uh, staunch Rush Limbaugh Republican. Uh-huh. I used to listen to him, and I was, you know, a, a capitalist, and I came up through the software industry, and uh, I had a lot of ideas about all that. But I've I've crossed over to this sort of uh, Star Trek utopian idea that with high tech the way it is, and with, <laughs> with our increasing potential to possibly eliminate or you know do something with world hunger and poverty that we should have a baseline income for everyone and the reason i love that is because if we had if everybody in the united states had a baseline income of sixty thousand dollars a year and we could afford to just give people that and they didn't have to work for it robots did their work these people would get bored and they would go out and set up a little shop and they'd start selling uh either beef patties or, you know, handcrafted. It, we would turn back into that rural society that we used to be in well, a very different way. Wouldn't if, that be cool? If if yeah. you are assuming the best in people, uh, I could agree with you. But and, and I guess maybe from my perspective, any ideological utopia in, in many one way or another is generally nothing more than a pipe dream. As, as, as wonderful it is, it, as it is to picture and, and desire it to be actualized. Um, to me personally, I think humankind is far too greedy, self-serving, egotistical, fat, lazy and incompetent to to survive the the utopia that we are presenting um in fact i'll draw reference to an experiment that was done maybe you've heard of it the mouse utopia experiment did you hear of it no i haven't okay look it up you will find it incredibly fascinating and i'll just give you a quick little synopsis the idea was to take a colony of mice and to create for them mouse nirvana you know, okay. they had plenty of stuff to do. They were safe. There was no predators, constant amounts of food. You know, um, everything was provided for them in complete and absolute luxurious comfort. The, 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 the mouse world of their dreams. And, and they were allowed to basically just live their little mouse lives, you know, and, and breed and reproduce and raise their kids. And what ended up happening, I don't won't, won't go into all the details, I won't spoil it completely for you, but go ahead and read the study, you'll find it amazing, uh, was complete and utter absolute social anarchy. Wow. Not not <laughs> just, and I mean, I'm not just talking about like, like some, some mouse went crazy or there was some genetic deficiency. No, the actual complete and utter social dynamics of the colony decayed into oblivion. Yeah. To where the the entire colony had actually wiped itself out in, I think, less than 20 generations. Or, and when I mean la- wiped itself out, as in the last breedable pair had died off or one of the last breedable members had died off at this particular stage uh, during the experiment. So, if we were, by some freaking miracle... <laughs> delivered into some sort of utopia star trek utopia as is pictured i think it would lead to our inevitable destruction in short order i picture idiocracy i picture idiocracy i picture us creating a really cool amazing world full of a bunch of privileges and then no everyone just kind of stops learning Everyone yeah. gets real comfortable with the people that have already learned. And then all the people that learned everything all die out and no one's left but freaking morons and no one can take care of anything anymore. That's that's what I picture, truthfully. It's one of my favorite movies. Love that movie. <laughs> it, 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 it truly is on my top 10 list of favorite yeah. movies of all time. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, we would need an enemy. I guess it, perhaps we could create a country that would do that as long as we had Well, enemies. we would need some sort of struggle. You know, I truthfully believe. Well, that goes know, back to Buddhism. Well, agreed. No, no. And struggle builds character. Is I believe that's a that's a Buddhist principle. You know that 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 the the attaining of the the nirvana is not even really worth it without the struggle to attain it. So part of your life path, part of your experiences, part of what you're going through, is the forsake of you finding your way, finding your direction, finding right. your path. So, you know, a a adversity while granted is going to be painful and difficult, will invariably almost always teach a lesson, if not also build character. Yeah, You become an improved person. Now look at the people that we stand on the backs of. 
Look at the people that lived in very, very rough, rugged, wild, you know, uh, privilege to the to the elements, to wild animals, to nomads, robbers, thieves, no police, no central structure to protect them. They were they were on their own yeah. and they probably spent a lot of their time afraid. And, and now look at us. L look at where we stand on the backs of these people. We think we're flying. We're only flying because we're standing on the backs of all these people who have suffered and struggled so much to provide for us this right. comfort. Now, if we embrace the comfort too much, not only are we going to destroy ourselves, but we're also insulting them and what they've sacrificed to bring it to us. Yeah. Let's not do that. Let, let's not be disrespectful to the people that gave us all this. Let's let's take note and appreciate and understand their struggle and what they had to go through to give us what we have. It's interesting. I'm... Uh... 10 miles north of me about two or three weeks ago, that struggle almost came to my door. Mm. They were boarding up businesses here and uh, Minneapolis was on fire. <laughs> mm. Oh yeah. No, where, uh, what, what part of, I'm sorry. You said what part of the country are you in? I didn't catch it. I, I'm in Minnesota. Just, uh, oh, Minnesota. Okay. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm like 10 miles from where they killed, killed that, that man. Oh, oh please kill that man. Oh, and the, the riot wow. uh, happened in areas where, you know, we would go to restaurants and to the, you know, the Apple store and uh, oh, the whole thing was on fire. And it was a pretty, <laughs> it was a pr pretty. So you were fact. just, you're pretty much right in the epicenter of it, of all. You're in the epicenter. Yeah. My yeah. 35 W is just outside my door. That's where that truck came roaring down. And, and uh, it, it was a scary, you know, that plus COVID. It's like, when is 2020 going to stop? <laughs> yeah, that's that's frightening. You know, that really is frightening. Uh, I, you know, I, frankly, any of the inner cities right now are frightening. Right. Uh, I, I don't I, you know, I would probably jump in a car and drive as far from Seattle as I pro possibly could if I lived there yeah. right now, um, because that, that place is just absolutely completely frightening um yeah, uh, i've seen uh you know the uh minnesota nice and and, and out here where i live mm -hmm. uh the, you know you you don't think racism is a thing but then if i drive uh just 20 blocks north of me right and and i've seen horrible atrocities and i've seen i've seen the police doing terrible things that mm -hmm. i don't know i don't want to piss the police off too bad <laughs> yeah they might come for you next because... yeah i know it's just... <laughs> well they uh google, they, I told... google told us about someone on the internet talking bad about the police go get them yeah right i i uh i told the story on uh on on my channel on one of the, one of the hangouts i think about my run-in with the police recently it was interesting mm. i think it was with standing for truth when i was talking to him mm. but the, this thing about having uh uh, Nirvana. I mean, it's it's interesting. It's almost like we need suffering. We need, you know, we need that. Uh, like uh, for ethics, we need our Ted Bundys. If mm. it weren't for psychopaths, Indeed. I think our own ethics would start to deteriorate. Of course, I think you have a religious solution for that. But well, you know, we are. Do, but. I mean, we are told. I think in Paul, I forget the verse, but you know, the the I think it's in Romans. You know, the laws are put there for for bad people. You know, the laws weren't delivered for good people, so that we would know what's good. It was, you know, we, we all have an innate sense of of an understanding of empathy and reciprocity. But basically, we have all these internal things that the atheists tend to rely upon. You know, yeah. like the, like the secular humanist moral code is basically built upon the primary two layers, primary two pillars of empathy and reciprocity. And as long as you have both of those things, you can have a justifiably um, functional moral environment. But yeah. once you lose one of those things, or once one of those things breaks down, the other won't hold it up. Yeah. The other won't hold the morality up. So it ends up being kind of, in many ways, sociologically, a very delicate construct, you know, and very easy to knock down, um, which is why you do tend to see secular societies tend to lean towards um, the, the, the fascistic side rather than the free speech side is because it, it's not that they it's not that they can't handle the speech that will destroy their ideology. It's that the speech might destroy the structure of the morality that the ideology is built upon. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So like like to me, it, it's a very, very delicate balance of what we're proposing 
as cultural or social norms because there are ramifications based upon just the natural byproduct of the human condition. You know, it all comes back to, uh, well, first of all, when you were talking about the, the, uh, the, the darkness of the human race and how, mm. you know, we're basically screwed, mm. uh, my thought was, I'm glad I'm 69 and I'm not going to be here much longer <laughs> and, and that I am not going to have eternal life and I won't have to watch this circus. Uh, basically, well, I, I gladly would give up the tragedy in the in, in my life and uh, any foreknowledge of what's going to happen to this race. But uh, well, what else was I going to say? And now I forgot the first point. Well, anyway. it, it's okay. But just to clarify real quick, it, you know, the idea of of there being an existence of free will in the in the eternal universe, the, the one it, it's just to explain just briefly, because it is a little bit sometimes of a confusion of conflation, is that the free will environment of the future is going to be the same as the free will environment that we have now. But the primary difference is God's reactionary to primary position. See, right now, because of the fallen state of man, he is in a morally reactionary position for the sake of maintaining his righteousness and his fairness and his mercy. In the future, he will be morally primary. So well, what that means is that anything that's done wrong is immediately uncovered, known, and dealt with. So no one can be conniving or th thieving or stealing. I mean, they can, but, but there's always that deterrent of knowing the moment you do it, you will be caught. And because those beings will be freed of the natural impulse inclinations of what we call in Christendom fleshly desires, they won't have the same types of impulses we will. It's not that they won't have also temptations, but they won't have the fleshly egotistical connection to the temptations anymore. They'll be, they'll be overcomable with the knowledge that they will be answered for instantaneously in a primary moral fashion as opposed to reactionary. Just to clarify, but go ahead and respond or go on with your point. Yeah, that uh, I would choose to opt out of that. Okay, <laughs> I've been there. Hey, no, no, I've been there. I, I was at that point, especially when I had embraced atheism, to say, you know, I, I kind of like the idea of living a life of libertarian free will and then disappearing into oblivion. That sounds much more fun than living a life, you know, focusing on on living for other people and trying to admonish, you know, standards of love that I've been delivered, and then also have to answer to a holy God at the end of it. That doesn't sound as fun. I think I'd rather take the first one. So trust me, I've been there. I. I I just can't, I mean, I just can't tenably stick to it. And that's just on me. You know, I, I have to go the other way because the other way is what makes more sense to me than the other one. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm burning out. Okay. No, I, hey, you know what? We made it our 90 minutes, I think. But so I have we're pretty much there. I have a couple um, questions if you don't mind. Oh, no, I, please go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Are, That's cool. are you a young earth creationist? And absolutely you don't have... not. Absolutely okay. not. No. Uh, and so, I don't have a problem with them, but I do have a problem with the ones that are strictly so. As okay. in like, like for instance, Ken Ham says you can't be Christian unless you're young earth. That I would, ha yeah. I would have an issue with, but otherwise they can believe what they want. Okay. And I have a request. Do you read a lot? I do. Okay. There's a book called Beyond Theology by Ellen Watts. Okay. I, I think I've actually seen parts of that. I, I think I've, okay. I've seen a few people referencing it. And I was reading that book when I was 15 years old, and that's what inspired the spiritual experience. But it, uh, he, uh, he has a different view of Christianity from a Buddhist perspective, hmm. and he calls it the Chinese box where you put one inside the other. My friend and I became Catholics one summer on purpose. We became believers on purpose for it was to be a three-month. I'm sorry return. to hear that. I'm sorry to hear that you that you went into Catholicism. I apologize. Oh well, it, it was it, it just seemed to be the uh, well. He was a Catholic. Uh, his, his family was. Hmm. Yeah, we, we were atheists, but we we basically decided to believe on purpose, and we became Christians for a summer. And we had some amazing experiences, hmm. but it was interesting. But anyway, Beyond Theology inspired that. But uh, the neat thing about Beyond Theology is it takes a great deal parts of the Bible. And explains them very much like how you were explaining parts of the Bible, you know, with the Lamb's blood and all of that. Just, mm. just and Watts, uh, he, I, I think he started out in the seminary, and mm. he crossed over into studying the studying Eastern religion. But he has a pretty amazing perspective on Christianity, which is mm. expansive. Very. I should expansive. look into that. What, what's the name of it? I'm sorry. 
Uh, it's called Beyond Theology. Beyond Theology. Chris Watts, did you say? Uh, Ellen. Ellen Watts. Ellen Watts. Let me write that down here. Yeah. Ellen Watts. Beyond. I'm sorry. One more time. Uh, theology. Beyond Theology. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Have you heard of Kafai, by the way? Uh, the mushroom guy on. The, he, he manages the. No, energy. I don't think so. K F E I D M T mushrooms. All that. Oh, anyway. No, I don't think so. I don't okay, think that's that. from earlier. We were talking about. Oh something. no, you're talking about the psychedelics. You're okay. Yeah, the psychedelics. Okay. Anyway. anyway. Okay. But cool. Uh, okay. Well, hey, yeah. this was a this was actually a great talk. I think it went really well, and I appreciate it. Um, and I think we really got to explore. Um, each other's different perspectives. I'm happy to do it again. Um, sure. And even if you want to pick a topic or you'd like to go over, you know, one of these other perspectives or even the near-death experiences, I'd be happy to do so. Um, Immutable Destiny in the chat there uh, has been been watching us the whole time. So shout out to them. Appreciate you joining yep. and uh, watching your friend here. Uh, and certainly if you want to have a chat with me, just shoot me an email. I put it there. And uh, we will set something up uh, like your friend here. Well, sir, uh, thank you so much uh, for your time and uh, this this nice chat and this cordial conversation. I appreciate it. Uh, try to go a little easy on my boy, John. <laughs> oh, no. No, John is uh, – I, I am opening up on John, man. I, I am I am all over that guy. All right. Uh, well, that's I have reason. Seem, I'm yeah, sorry. So I apologize. You focus on him. You do seem to focus on him. But <laughs> understand oh, – Understand he's a brother and a friend at least. And, and, and he has my, John has my full attention. <laughs> I can see that. I can see that. I, absolutely. Well, well, I wish you guys the best. Maybe if, if needed, we could set up a conversation uh, between you two here and we could go over something specific. Maybe try. Yeah, well, maybe we could talk about other things besides evolution. Uh, uh, sure. No, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, in fact, I've been encouraging John. Let's uh, let's talk about some new and differing uh, perspectives as well, too, and and uh, enlighten each other. And iron sharpens iron. And John's on board. John John to me is a uh, is a good guy. Is a good guy for sure. But uh, okay. Well, beautiful. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, Mike, appreciate thank it. You. Thanks for being here. And like I said, by the way, remember, feel free to download this whole thing, post up on your channel. I say that to all my guests. You know, do, yeah. Do please uh, link link me in your channel and i will do the perfect. same on mine perfect so, okay excellent wonderful thank you okay. sir. sounds great okay. you have a great day sir thanks so much okay. Bye. all right well hey folks that uh that went well you know that was great and i i do enjoy the more productive conversations you know it doesn't have to turn into some sort of weird screaming match you know when you when you're going to approach these conversations with people you know, it, it's it's more important to not have to always take that position where you think you have to one up them, you know, and even if you could, I mean, even if that does happen where you think you can one up someone on a conversation or you can somehow get the win or get them in a gotcha, is it necessarily going to be productive? Is it necessarily going to move the conversation forward? You know, this is something we should keep in mind as all of us are moving into the debate sphere is to remember a certain uh, moniker of respect to the people on the other side that, you know what, they've spent a lot of time constructing their perspectives, their presuppositions, okay? They've probably spent as much time, if not more on it as you have. So it behooves you for the sake of the benefit of open lines of communication for you to give them that level of respect that they didn't just throw together all their beliefs and everything they know in an afternoon. And, and that seems to be the way that the conversation wants to sometimes go these days. And this is why I'm done with Discord. And if you guys, if you guys have not seen me on Discord, you know that's why. Because to me, Discord is conversation cancer. Okay? You have nothing but a bunch of ignorant, petulant children yelling at themselves and yelling at other people about a bunch of stuff that hardly any of them know anything about. And if you ever even dreamed to try to interject with a moment of cognitive truth, you'll simply be laughed out of the sphere or have your name changed to something offensive or whatever it is. So, so there are certain environments, people, in this world that are just not condu conducive to good conversation. This this was a good conversation. This was a wonderful conversation. This was enjoyable. And to me, personally, it was productive. And it, and it, it was the opportunity for me to expose some of my perspectives to the audience and for him to expose some of his perspectives to the audience. And we have entrusted you 
as rational, free-thinking, intelligent people to come to your own conclusions. I don't want anyone on this channel to try and force any type of perspective on presupposition on anyone, which is why Darth Dawkins will never be a contributing member here. We have to have a certain level of respect. Otherwise, we're wasting time. Truthfully, if the conversations are already devolving into screaming matches, uh, gotcha questions, and everyone just trying to one-up each other, you know what's around the corner, right? Violence. I mean, it's just the, na the nature of things. Part of human sociology. Once we can no longer talk to each other, we act out. It's what it is. Let's not encourage it, shall we? All right. That was a lot of fun. Loved it. 90 minutes in, exactly about the time I wanted to do it. Folks, thank you so much. I really appreciate you joining. Again, I am a tiny channel, 45 subscribers. I'm still small, trying to get out in the world, expose myself a little bit. So please like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. You're all wonderful people. God bless you. Have a great day.